So from my side, my name is Nicholas Bersoto. As Dominic already mentioned, I am the lead for Meetup AI Berlin. And I've been doing a couple of events and partnerships with, uh, with my good friends at Startup College for a while now. Uh, and they always bring very, very interesting groups of people together with our traditional Meetup AI community. And because nobody actually comes in to hear me talk, we're going to be slowly starting in the event. We're going to be actually having four speakers tonight. Each one of them is going to be giving a small taste of the work they're doing right now. They represent different parts of the ecosystem with scale-ups, startups, research, and corporate. And then we're going to be following that up with a panel to discuss the implementation of emerging technologies inside of factories. Uh, you can already start putting your questions in the chat as you hear the speakers presenting. Uh, and I will, be taking, I will be looking at them and I will be bringing them to the panel later on. However, the presentation from Heiko Witte from Rolls-Royce will be the one that you can already send me the me messages and uh, put the messages on the channel. And I will immediately uh, come to them right after the talk because uh, Heiko might need to leave us a bit early today. With that, I think I already spoke more than enough, and I would like to invite Jackson Bond to the stage. Jackson is the co-founder of Relayer, one of the biggest success stories of the Berlin ecosystem. Very, very happy to have him with us uh, today. He has more than 15 years experience in IoT and in mobile internet space, both in startup environments, international companies. And as I said, now he invests all this expertise as a co-founder and Chief Industry Business Development at Relayer. So Jackson, uh, the stage is yours. I'm looking forward to your case. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me and can you see my presentation? Great. Yes, we can. Thanks, Nico. Thanks, Dominic, for this opportunity and uh, welcome around the world. I am going to assume that our participants are uh, not just in Germany. Um, today, I want to speak about um, what we are seeing from the machine maker side. So the ones who make the machines in the factories, because this will impact uh, immediately how the factories are run and how they're being operated. Um, before I do, maybe just a quick word about Relayer. So Relayer, we're about eight years old. I'm one of the founders of the company. Um, we were acquired by Munich Re in 2018. So uh, under that, uh, ownership, we have now, uh, in my role, I have been focused on helping CEOs and CFOs primarily uh, of machine making businesses and machine servicing businesses uh, understand what a disruptive business case would look like for their particular business. Um, Relayer is owned by directly by Hartford Steam Boiler, HSB. That's a, an American-based company in Hartford, Connecticut. They're the leading reinsurance company for um, industrial equipment and industrial assets. And that's owned by then Munich Re. Munich Re is, some of you may know, some of you may not, is a, the world's largest reinsurance company for um, around the world. They generate something like $60 billion of revenue, I think, and have a balance sheet of uh, probably in excess of $350 billion, very large entity. Um, and they see the world a little bit differently than, uh, than most people do. Um, they see the world uh, in terms of risk as we do now as well. And data has a huge impact on the way you model risk. So let me just, what I'd like to do is show you one example of what we mean by a specific business case. But to understand that business case, uh, with a machine maker that I, I want to show you. I want to give you a little bit of context real quick. Um, so first of all, there are four conditions in the market that we see that are really impacting machine sales. Um, first of is uh, leasing, leasing regulations around leasing and accounting of leasing. So 2019, the IFRS 16 was put into place, which meant that if you're leasing equipment, um, so machine makers often will provide their equipment because it's too expensive. They'll provide it as a leasing uh, option. And the leasing option used to be quite, quite friendly because in terms of cash flow, you pay every month. In terms of your balance sheet, you pay every month. But now since, since IFRS 16, you now have to account for the entire, uh, basically the entire cost of that machine or that leasing term 
over five or seven years, or however long the leasing period is on your balance sheet. So you don't have the benefit of a monthly uh, operational cost like you, you used to. Also, banks are increasingly risk averse due to crises. So the new regulations put into place by Basel three and four means that there are new restrictions for providing loans to small companies who would normally buy the equipment to put into their factories. Um, they're risk averse, which makes it more difficult to get the loans, um, which we think opens up opportunities for types of investors and in one way you could consider us an investor, uh, how we deploy our capital differently than a bank or than a leasing company. The third thing that we see is that data collection and data access is accelerating. It, the cost of data access, data processing, data collection, data storage is, is continually dropping and becoming more and more accessible to smaller and smaller companies, which opens up more opportunity along the value chain. So those who collect and acquire the data have more leverage in terms of value creation. And this leads to disintermediation along the value chain between machine builders, machine owners and machine buyers, machine distributors and machine servicing companies. This requires, particularly now in the current crisis, but in all of the previous crises that we've been going through, whether it's uh, the financial crisis or the global trade crisis or the pandemic, uh, a demand and a need for more resilient business models. And when we talk about business model resiliency, we're looking at 10 different dimensions. You wanna have recurring long-term stable revenue, not lumpy revenue, according to CapEx sales that might be influenced by um, tariffs, for example, that could uh, change the way you sell your equipment. You want predictable revenue. You also want no risk. You want to be able to avoid any kind of risk that will impact your business or threaten your business if your machines fail. That means you want to be monitoring your equipment as uh, in real time as much as possible, always if it's possible. And this has an impact on your cost structure. So you want to be generating and reducing uh, your, the various uh, areas of cost that you generate um, or that your customers would normally generate from operating your equipment. You want predictable, pro you want predictable um, repair costs. You want predictable operational costs, ideally predictable spare parts costs. Um, and then there's a the question of utilization. So how are your cu customers using the machines or are they standing idle? Because if they're, if they're not being used, this is a monetization opportunity to recover those assets and potentially deploy them elsewhere. Also, you think about real-time product improvements. Collecting data can flow directly into the way you make your machines. And then obviously, if you can capture old equipment, refurbish it, you have opportunities for secondary and tertiary markets. And then of course, if you're monitoring your equipment, you can create enormous degrees of stickiness with your customers, an ongoing relationship with your customers. And one of the resilient business models that we're gonna show you in a second in terms of examples is this equipment as a service or a notion of providing equipment, not as a CapEx sale. So you don't sell the equipment and give up ownership. You keep the equipment and provide it on a monthly basis or a utilization basis or some pay per X basis. Why? Because if you look at the lifetime of the equipment, you sell the equipment once typically in the old paradigm, you sell the equipment once and that only makes up 20 to 30% of the actual value of the equipment. And then you upsell support, repair, maintenance and service contracts, performance contracts, value added services and financial services. You upsell all of these types of services onto the asset that you've sold, which is very costly. Now equipment as a service allows you to bundle all of these additional value adds into one simple pricing. It's a mathematical model that you can create and bundling in all of these different elements uh, into one simple monthly or per part or per, uh, per hour or per month, whatever the, the uh, unit of measurement needs to be. And by doing so, if you look at that middle line, you're driving your costs down and you're increasing your margin. Because over time, as you collect more data, your service and all of the other costs associated with that machine in the factory is being, is being reduced, driven down. 
thereby increasing. And it's not just us talking about it. This is a market study that just shows some of the growth in equipment as a service, as a model with 35% compound annual growth, um, looking at a tripling of penetration over the next four or five years. So it's, it's a hugely attractive market and a lot of the equipment manufacturers are starting to think about offering this, which will impact the factories. Um, and so if you look at Relayer, what do we do? What are we trying to do to make this possible? It's not just about technology. Sure, we are collecting data from real-time equipment, uh, from, from, from equipment in real time. We're mo modeling that data for predictive algorithms, but we're also wrapping that into insurance guarantees. We're guaranteeing the performance of those assets, guaranteeing uptime, guaranteeing quality, guaranteeing output or quantity, these kinds of things. But one thing stands in the way to make sorry, I was on mute. Um, and if if you if you need to get if you need to transfer into a subscription based model, someone has to help finance the equipment, the capex, and that's where Munich Re comes in. In our case, is supports us with machine financing, and and then what we do is we we wrap that into a business model and we take a share of that business model. That's sort of our model from Relayer. So if we look at Trump as an example, uh, they're one of those hidden champions. They generate 3.5 billion in revenue, about 14,000 employees annually. And they make CNC machines, laser cutting machines, these kinds of metal processing machines. And so they're looking at trying to shift away from CapEx to OPEX. These are expensive machines. That means that there's limited appetite in the market, particularly now in crises, for investing in capex. But the upside of owning one of these pieces of equipment means you get a lot of output. They're highly efficient and highly automatic machines. But who's gonna take the, the capex risk? Who's gonna own the machine to enable a service model? This is where we come in. And just to outline how that model looks really quickly, there's Trumpf, the OEM manufacturer of the machine. Then there is the end user of the machine, the customer who uses the machine in their factory. We create what we call a special purpose vehicle or an equipment as a service uh, company in the middle and buy the equipment directly from Trump. The, and we put those, that equipment on our balance sheet and then have a contract towards the end user, the end customer, the factory or the factory owner or the operator of the equipment. They now have a contract with the equipment as a service company in the middle and pay per X. In this case, it's pay per piece of metal cut. It's a pay per part model. And then we use the data from Relayer. So Relayer is consuming the data from the machines to provide uh, data for invoicing on a pay per part basis, but also to drive the insurance guarantees around the uh, uptime of the machines and around any risk or damage associated with the failure of the machines. Um, so you're seeing that it's a, a group of four companies, basically Munich Re at the top with their subsidiaries, Hartford Steam Boiler and Relayer, together with the domain expert, the laser cutting expert, Trumpf, to create a different model uh, than you're used to seeing in the market, which aligns the, the data and the data sharing and all of the performance metrics required for optimal use of the machines along that value chain. So from the machine maker, all the way down to the machine user. And what we're doing here is we're actually also bundling in the cost of the raw material. So this is interesting. We're able to provide tr basically Trumpf end users a guaranteed pricing point for a piece of metal cut with their machine. So let's say, for example, it might be X dollars. Let's just say for the, for the case, it might be $10. Um, so that there's a specific price because we can also um, control the cost of the raw material better in this group, in this consortium, also leveraging the financial strength of our mother company, Munich Re. And that's the example I wanted to show you. Um, but what, I, what, I, what we mean when we look at this, we think of individual assets, but these can also be fleets of assets. Risk can be distributed across multiple assets or groups of assets or pooled across groups of assets up to an entire factory where you have multiple pieces of equipment within one, uh, within one setup. And we've gone to this third layer, the factory as a service 
with Porsche. We have a joint venture now with Porsche where we're actually using a bunch of different types of equipment in a factory environment to provide and with the aim of uh, providing batch production. So smaller batch production, but at the cost and price point of more industrial grade production by leveraging the data and the efficiency and providing the uptime guarantees uh, for the performance of the entire factory. I'll pause there um, and end with uh, our lessons from the past. So uh, in the past eight years we've been doing this, we realized that technology is really not the answer. It's an enabler. Digitization is not uh, a market. It is a terminology. <laughs> um, what really matters is really the business, the business outcome and how you're driving a business outcome uh, based off of the data. And so what we're seeing in the, in the market is there's a lot of focus on collecting data, but um, if you don't have an actual business case behind the collection of that data, it's very difficult to, um, to build a sustainable and resilient business case uh, alone just off of, the, off of the data that you're collecting. So with that, I will end, and I hope um, it's been within 10 minutes. If there are any questions, you could ask them at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jackson. Uh, once again, if you have already any questions about Jackson's presentation, just add it uh, on the chat. And then I would like to slowly bring Heiko Witt from uh, Rolls-Royce uh, to present. Uh, we're gonna be taking the questions from Heiko's talk straight after he speaks. And if anything else comes about, we're gonna be coming uh, to talking about it in the, in the panel. So Heike is, uh, represents your Rolls-Royce and he's a business development consultant. He's highly experienced in the industry 4.0 uh, part and especially in aerospace engineering. And for the past 24 years, he has been engaged with Rolls-Royce and now he's gonna be sharing some of his insight on the topic uh, with us. Heiko, thank you very much for being here with us and the stage is yours. Thank you, Nicholas. I hope everybody can understand me well. Um, yeah, so I wanna give you in the next 10 minutes a little bit of a glimpse in terms of what digital manufacturing means in for Rolls Voice. First of all, and for everybody, Rolls Voice bought aerospace engines. So you see an engine there in our virtual reality environment. And um, so what we have to consider, and just a little bit to my person, I'm an engineer. So I, I um, went to various stages in engineering, to so project management, towards a role in transformation and realizing over the past years and trying to drive this in Rolls Voice what the digital transformation means for Rolls Voice. When we looked at Relayers presentation, equipment as a service, we actually um, innovated the service of engines, so more or less propulsion as a service, as a concept. However, when we look in the manufacturing field, what we do in manufacturing by now, this is very di uh, different to the automotive or any other consumer industry, because all factories are what you would call in German uh, manufacturers, so very much handmade engines with uh, about one to two engines we assemble uh, per day, but nothing which compares to real serious production where full automation makes uh, uh, is relevant. So going to the next slide, Dominic. Um, the first element, if you start thinking about what digital manufacturing means is that it's not, it's not like uh, that you have to digitize as a market or as a, specific uh, tool or in implementing tools. It's all about kind of an integrative thinking. Digitization only makes sense where you actually hit the triangle with those uh, three circles uh, shown in the picture. First of all, the person needs to be in the middle. So anything we do in our manufacturing and our assembly area needs to benefit the workers who has to apply those techniques. So therefore, that is a uh, key to success. Second, certainly the tool set with all the sensors, with the network, with programming and collaborative systems. And the third element being the process understanding. So anything we do, not only because of cost, but also from content needs to satisfy those three areas. It needs to bring those elements together to be successful in the, uh, in the field of digital manufacturing. So preparing the future and develop the technologies to serve those three elements and bring them together is key uh, for success. If we go to the next slide, I'll show you a little bit about the landscape we've been developing over the past years. 
taking a step back, we obviously have a very much digitized and computerized landscape in engineering. We use uh, high performance compute to do our computation of fluid dynamics, to do finite element mechanics, and uh, to uh, do a lot of analysis and simulation on the design and engineering field. We use a lot of data analytics on the service engineering. However, one of the key uh, key issues or key challenges we had to uh, go after is the interfaces between the manufacturing and assembly environment and, and design engineering on the one end, as well as uh, service on the other end. So to attack that, we developed that landscape and used actually uh, projects together with partners, both on the Fraunhofer side, as well as on the uni university side, primarily with Scott was to look into how can we combine design engineering and manufacturing, generating a tool set for digital assembly instructions, which is not only uh, innovating the way we assemble an engine or bring the assembly instruction to the fitters, but also how can we exchange information between the shop floor and uh, the design area. Product data viewer, I'll show an example in a minute, is another data aggregation platform to actually pull data out of the operational uh, out of operations towards the designer. On the logistics side, and uh, we generated a production and shop floor planner. And um, if, if you know a little bit about the consumer automotive industry, you would say, okay, why is that so difficult? For us, because we have 20,000 parts, but only one to two engines per day, the exception is a rule. So every part will have a different history and may come late or soon, but not just in time. And it needs to be kitted uh, before it actually uh, leaves the factory from the supplier. It needs to be kitted to particular engines. So a very complex uh, issue, which we needed to resolve uh, from a logistic point of view. And there are a couple of other things uh, which we developed. Primarily what the shows is we are trying to develop islands of opportunity to uh, discover interfaces between the manufacturing, design and service engineering. And those islands, while they grow bigger, some of the interfaces are getting fixed and the proper understanding is being developed. Going to the next slide, please. We have the opportunity in Rolls-Royce to use virtual reality and augmented reality. And this just shows a couple of use cases where we've innovated the way we are designing and making a product. A couple of years ago, 20 years ago, when I started here uh, in the factory just south of Berlin, um, we had these wooden mock-ups of engines where we actually fitted the pipes and the cables around it to see whether there were any clashes. As you can see in the top uh, picture, that is now done fully in a digital way. And uh, there is a lot of understanding going on when the designers actually get in, into our virtual reality environment, into the cave and realize, okay, there are clashes which can be avoided. There are issues which need to be fixed before the engine design actually leaves the door. We now uh, looked into factory layouts as well, which means what, um, what rig, what machine, what position of the engine uh, needs to be there in the factory on our shop floor. As engines, when they are assembled, cannot be moved easily. So the factory layout uh, requires a lot of thinking and um, it, will, it also enables the workers and planners to consider ergonomy and other factors when uh, layouting. And that not only happens when you build a new factory, but anytime there's a change in load and demand or in anything, there needs to be a new look at the factory layout, particularly now in time of pandemics, where obviously replanning is a rule rather than the exception. Assembly sequences is another example where we actually avoided building expensive tools before realizing that there is an issue with that. So assembly sequences uh, shows us a way how the engine can be assembled and what tools can be applied and whether they're actually fit for purpose or need to be redesigned. And obviously there's a wide field of simulation and visualization of the simulation of the engine. Going to the next slide. This is a future which uh, obviously will take some time to get towards full exploitation in a traditional aerospace company, but I think that's not a novelty what we show here. In terms of a digital twin, which we currently have from a product structure, from a design, and also from a factory shop floor, for our, any of our future products will move towards cyber physical platforms. So generating actually a digital parent before building a product, 
And that is particularly true for our new ambitions where we look towards more electric and hybrid electric and full electric propulsion systems, where first of all, we will have to work and we will work with part, uh, other partners, suppliers, as well as uh, research partners and um, partners, business partners in that con context, but also in generating a digital parent, a digital mock-up, a digital representation of the future product, whatever it is, and deriving the physical parameters out of it. So that is the future where obviously a representation of a future factory plays a big role. On the next slide, I'd like to show you just a little glimpse of where have we started. That's the work done with Fraunhofer IPK in Berlin to look at some of the challenges I already described diversity complexity of IT tools in a traditional company, very a lot of data, loads of data, but they are inconsistent, they are redundant and not all held in one system. And the data are not being used. So one example in terms of what we've been facing and why that project was so important is when you're on the shop floor and when the fitter works on a, assembling an engine, at what time he's going to call the design engineer? Only if he has failed or is actually not able to assemble the engine in a proper way. But there are so many in-betweens where he's got to uh, take a part off, try to refit it again, etc. because it's basically all handmade. And all this information we would like to capture and want to play back to the designer. So, and doing this was part of that project as a product data viewer, which if we go one further slide, you see how the platform has been developed and how it looks like and actually representing information from assembly, from the shop floor, from operations on, on, an, on uh, the part, on a group of parts and actually playing it back to the design and the first way to say what issues has been arising. The next steps we're gonna undertake is that we wanna contextualize those data and derive a pattern, derive um, machine-based learning onto this to see where are there repetitive issues, what could be improvements done to the design to make it better fit for purpose, fit for assembly or fit for uh, design. So that is the first step in actually contextualizing data from the shop floor, playing it back to the designer and generating algorithms to make improvements to the product and make improvements to the full product understanding. Why is that important for us? Because we in the future not only want to, but need to be able to uh, be to fully understand every individual propulsion system. So to actually know what influence the making, the making of the product has on the final product characteristics, even if it is within the variation of what's acceptable. But to do so will help us to better design a service proposal, uh, proposal as well as a business model around the future propulsion. Next slide and final slide. And I hope I'm not going beyond the 10 minutes. Digital transformation journey. As usual in a big company that looks rather complex, but <laughs> there are some key digital capabilities we have to set up. First of all, we need an IoT ecosystem and integration of those different data. That is complex, as I described, because we work with product lifecycle systems, manufacturing execution systems, and so on. So big data hubs where we need to pull out the data to make them available uh, for data innovation. A data architecture to generate those domain-driven data products, and not only and evolving from our current business model, obviously contextualizing uh, the data and enabling model-based system engineering, and establishing based on data the capability to develop potential business models <clears throat> for the future, whatever that is in partnerships, but also in collaboration with other partners and suppliers. So that's a little bit of a glimpse why this is important, not only because the factory is important, but because it has such a big impact on the final product service and uh, business offering we are providing as a company. And that's it for now. And I'm happy to uh, answer any questions arising. Thank you very much, Heiko.
Uh, I think we're going to end up bringing the questions uh, to the panel itself as it is. Uh, I think people need a bit more time to, to write their questions. Also, I would uh, ask people again to, to share where they're coming from. It's always a very exciting moment for us to see people coming from, from all over the place. And uh, also for networking purposes, if you want to say if you're coming from a startup, if you're coming from the corporate side, provide some information, that is always a good opportunity to meet other people, maybe in your field and in, in, in similar areas. And with that, I would like to bring Jack away, uh, the co-founder of Gleechee, and he will be presenting uh, his insights and his expertise right now. And once again, if you see already something in the presentation that you wanna ask Jacob later on, just uh, put it on a chat. I am there all the time seeing about all the interesting ideas. A big thank you for everybody who has already shared a couple of questions and we'll be bringing them to panel. But now, Jacob, stage is all yours. All right, perfect. I think everyone can see my screen and hear my voice. Really? Yes. Nice. Uh, so I'm Jacob uh, from Glitchy. We're a uh, Stockholm in Sweden based startup. Used to be very small. Now we're just small. I think we're getting closer to 30 people roughly now, we're aiming to go to roughly 40 people the coming few months. We are a company that is very tech focused and I love tech and usually in these type of meetups, I think it's more fun to talk about tech than too much about our business and pitching about us. If you have questions, please, please do uh, toss them in. But um, I'm going to focus foremost on some of the kind of tech we are bringing towards some of the challenges that we are seeing. And we're a company that are spanning across uh, two quite different uh, use cases. One is within robotics, which is the area that we are coming from. And one is within virtual reality. And uh, our first commercial product has just been launched within virtual reality. So I'm gonna put a little bit of extra emphasis on that. Dominic asked me specifically to talk a little bit about our uh, robotics aspects as well. So I'm happy to share a little bit about that. So I think that's easiest done by just sharing a little bit about our background. Uh, as mentioned, we're a very kind of techy company. We're coming from robotics research originally. One of my co-founders is a German researcher and uh, my other co-founder is a Chinese researcher. I will focus on this type of uh, robot in a research context. This, this Alma robot is pretty useless for most stuff. It is weak, it is slow, and it will certainly not take over the world like a Terminator. But it is quite interesting to do research on because it's quite flexible. And by placing this type of robot in a more generic setting, like a kitchen, uh, an environment uh, with, where the robot is, needs to use, for example, five fingers instead of just the parallel jaw gripper, we're kind of pushing the boundaries of how we need to develop systems to make smart robots be able to cooperate and work uh, together with humans to perform different types of tasks. So the way this type of research started off was uh, in essence uh, with this type of robot and trying to figure out how to grasp things. We're a company coming very much focused on robot grasping. And in essence, how this research could look is in a, kind of like this. You had a robot utilizing some kind of computer vision system to build a 3D model of an object an object that the robot has never seen before. We weren't so focused on the kind of computer vision challenge. We were more focused on the step after when the robot is supposed to perform an action on this particular object. So it's one thing that the robot has seen an identified object, but it needs to grasp the object. And this is one of the core challenges that we have been addressing. And I'm going to dig a little bit further into what this means. But as you can see here, we in essence developed these algorithms to tell the robot where to place his fingers in relation to an object. And one of the key aspects related to this is that it's not just about grasping an object in a way. We want the robot to perform different grasps depending on what the robot is intending to do. So for that reason, we have developed a system that can perform and create many different grasps. And then we can filter based on that, based on the intention of the robot. As kind of what we can see here, a robot can, we can make it grasp different objects uh, in different ways, depending on the purpose. So if we, send in that the robot is going to do a handover of this bottle. We're pouring 
for this bottle. Then the robot is obviously going to grasp it in different ways. So this is in essence what we see here. So this is an automatic solution. You haven't pre-programmed anything. You're not telling the fingers to go to a specific place. It's an automated system that's uh, based on predictive algorithms, analyzing an object and then telling a robot how to pick it up. So this is kind of the research that we were coming from. And when we founded the company a little bit more than five years ago, we realized that this problem related to technology, robots and computers understanding how grasps and interactions, kind of hand-based interactions are supposed to be performed, is a challenge across many different verticals and many different industries. We see that being a problem in, within 3D animation and games. I think a very typical example I usually do to emphasize this is that within uh, you know, the, the TV series Simpsons, all the characters only have four fingers. And that's because it takes so much extra time to animate just that fifth finger. So if you can kind of save that time, then it's worth the, the kind of effort, so to speak, to, to um, the fact that people don't see the fifth finger. Same thing applies to virtual reality, where it's quite complex to make the hand interaction look realistic. It's uh, the exact same problem. You need to tell a robot how to grasp an object. But in the virtual reality context, it's all about making it look realistic rather than making a robust or stable grasp. So we started applying this technology also within uh, virtual reality, and I'm going to touch a little bit more into that area. But in that context, it is the exact same algorithms doing the exact same things. And finally, we see it in robotics. And robotics, the key challenge has been that, I mean, robotics has been dominated, 70% uh, of the market has been within automotive industry, where the robots are doing repetitive tasks over and over and over again. Whereas we see a bigger demand now for this type of cobots, flexible robots. Um, service robotics is another uh, area that's growing immensely. And in all this type of context, we need robots that can pick up objects, interact with them, much more flexible. We can't have a robotic engineer pre-planning every single grasp for a robot. Then uh, we're not really going to be very good at automating a lot of tasks that demands these uh, human hands. I'm just touching a little bit upon this, uh, this kind of minority research side of things. I think this slide is, is quite interesting in the sense that this explains somewhat why it's, this is a difficult challenge. It is difficult to make robots or animated characters pick things up because our hands are among the most complex things we have in our body. This is called a homunculus. It's a picture of how the brain perceives the body from the motor standpoint. We see that the hands are enormous because they're so much more complex than the whole rest of the body. We have more joints in the hands than in the rest of the body. And this is causing a lot of uh, difficulties for re uh, kind of uh, repeating or, or replicating this for, for other use cases. So this is a particular challenge we're trying to address. So in essence, we found a glitch based on this vision, based on this formulation associated with a problem tied to the complexity of interaction for computers and robots. And uh, what we saw in the market is that we see humans stepping into the digital world increasingly with augmented reality or virtual reality, regardless of what kind of use case we see there being. And we see robots stepping into the human world uh, to be able to perform more complex tasks. And what we are positioning ourselves is to be kind of the vertical that enables and collects data, both from people uh, applying this technology and picking things in a virtual reality context, to continuously improve the system that will also power robots in the futures. So that's kind of how we, why we are spread across very different uh, industry segments. And uh, showing a little bit on how this looks today. This is uh, one of the applications we're uh, doing together with ABB. It's about allowing robots to work next to nurses in a hospital. And uh, the challenge here is that you might have hundreds of different surgical tools. Um, in this particular context, it's not about the robot actually using surgical tools to perform uh, surgery surgical operation. It is about making the robot able to pick them up to clean them and make sure that they are clean when they're being sent back to the operation. So, so in this challenge, they, they had this issue that they had to pre-program every single uh, object to be picked up in a special way, whereas we can uh, implement our, our, our software, our virtual grasp software, and enable the robot to pick it up in real time. So we can put in hundreds of different objects there and allow the robot to, to somehow interact with it. Um, this is a super exciting field, but we do see that kind of flexible and, and collaborative robotics is a few years away. Our first product is actually in a completely different segment. We're still doing a lot of these kind of pilot cases within robotics, testing out the technology, but you kind of easily see the bridge here into the, the field I mentioned earlier, virtual reality. So this is uh, the same human robot being controlled in a virtual reality setting. And the same technology is here instead powering the animated robotics hands. 
So we're in essence doing the exact same thing in the virtual reality environment as we did for the actual physical robot. And you can replace these robotics hands with humanoid hands and we can get these hands to pick up any object. So you can toss in thousands of different objects and our system automatically understands how to grasp and pick them up. And it's kind of the bridge into where we are, are, are today and where our main focus is commercially, where we started selling a product. We saw that a lot of industry companies do have 3D models of their environments. They can step into the environment, look around in it, but they can't really do that much more. We see that virtual reality has a huge power in, in helping people be able to train and practice different things. So we put our technology as a layer on top of these uh, uh, different uh, object databases that, uh, that big companies have. And we could automate the interaction between human and the environment. So we have all these different automated ways of creating grasp. We have all these automated ways of how to use a tool like a scissor or a screwdriver. And then we just put that on top of an environment, a manufacturing environment, and with that, we can take this robotic solution and make a virtual reality training solution that is scalable and easy to customize for your environment. So this is in essence making it simple for a big company to implement uh, virtual reality training for their specific use case, rather than trying to buy some off the shelf virtual reality application that's uh, somehow assuming that every training is supposed to look exactly the same. So we have taken this core technology associated with interaction to solve this, this, this key problem. I see that I'm running away a little bit on time here. So I'm gonna to try to push through a little bit quicker on the, the, the actual problem we're focusing on today, but it's associated with training within the industry. And this is our first product. We're launching our technology. We have packaged it as a product to solve some of these fundamental problems associated with huge learning periods for, for, for new employees. We see that this is becoming a bigger problem because as we are implementing more complex solutions to automate a lot of tasks, we're removing the simple stuff that people learn within one week. And we're increasing the amount of complex handling of machines or advanced robotics. So we actually are increasing the amount of knowledge that's needed to be handled from the staff as we're automating a lot of things. Uh, virtual reality is has been proven to solve a lot of these problems. And some of the studies we've been doing, we've seen that we can increase the efficiency and safety with over 15% uh, utilizing virtual reality as a component in training operators within manufacturing. We see we can reduce the amount of time spent in training. So instead of walking next to someone and not creating much value for a year, which is the case in a lot of factories, we can reduce that significantly to a few months by simulating a lot of the training experiences in a virtual reality uh, setting. Uh, we also see in the 50% of companies not using virtual reality today within the manufacturing area or planning on using that within the coming three years. So it's a really an upcoming area within a lot of use cases being deployed. Quickly to kind of wrap up how we have been bridging our technology, we see that hardware is coming to the market as being immensely much, much easier to access and afford. A few years ago, you had to have these big rooms that costed hundreds of thousands and it was complex to develop for. Today, we have VR headsets that have a higher quality for a few hundred euros. Uh, we see that the 3D scenes are, are something that is already existing at a lot of clients. We also see these huge object databases. So it's less about actually creating the 3D environment. What we are focusing on is the two layers below here, enabling that interaction, which is the technology we're bringing from robotics. And then another component that we have built the latest two years, pedagogical framework in essence to make it easy to give instructions, give feedback in this type of context. So with that, we have in essence built this platform to make it easy to deploy uh, VR training for, for any industry environment. You just started selling it as a software as a service model where you subscribe uh, based on the amount of courses rather than pay for the actual implementation. Super happy to tell more about that if, if anyone is interested. And I guess this is uh, going to be my last quick slide. Uh, what we see is that over 40% or almost 40% of large companies actually have started using virtual and augmented reality uh, technology to enhance abilities uh, in these type of simulated environments. So this is really something that is coming right now. Uh, and we've seen a lot of successful pilots and proof of concepts. And what we are trying to do is not only prove again that this technology is working because that has been proven, we're trying to bridge it to people and democratize this type of training and immersive experience. So I'm gonna stop there. And uh, yeah, I think there's time for questions later, thanks.
Exactly. Thank you very much, Jacob. And sorry again for butchering your name. Like this was really, really interesting. And for the meetup community joining joining us today, hands as a service. You heard it first at Meetup AI and Shadow of Colors. Like this is the first time that I ever see something like this. Um, as I mentioned before, we're going to be taking the questions up, uh, from Jacob Stock at the panel itself. But unfortunately, Heiko will have to be leaving us in a second. So we're going to be using the next few moments to to answer the questions specifically to his presentation. And this is also the last chance to write questions uh, regarding it. So I'm gonna be starting off with a question regarding data, uh, Heiko, coming from Ayman. Uh, and the question is, how do you know if the data gathered for a specific project is valuable? If its utility is only obvious after all the design and the manufacturing steps? Do you have a specific way criteria to gather that data? or do you export the gathering of the data to other companies? Very, very good question, uh, Ayman, regarding the value of data on the pre-development and pre-implementation process. Thank you very much for that question. Heiko, would you like to speak a bit about it? Uh, yes, I can, thank you. Great question. So first of all, we data is very precious, so we're trying not to export it, but basically trying to make sense out of our, it's um, in, in our company. I, I would say, what we do with the data is a little bit of an iterative process. So obviously in the design world, you start to identify key parameters, key data you'd like to know. And this is the first target of data we'd like to achieve. However, what we realized in the example I showed is it's sometimes the tacits and not spoken or not identified data, which actually make a difference. Because from a design perspective, you identify, for example, the diameter of a, of a certain disk is a key parameter to drive a certain parameter to certain characteristics. And so testing later, you identify something completely different. So therefore, it is a little bit um, looking into what is the right needle in the haystack, to be honest. So there is an, it is an iterative process, um, but it's basically trying to look from a data perspective coming from the other side. So not from the complex uh, uh, mechanical and mathematical calculations to design an engine, but more towards building a data landscape to see where can we find uh, dependencies, what data is useful to do and has a correlation and what hasn't got a correlation, how can we build it in? So there's no one and only answer to it. It's a learning process eventually. So obviously, uh, in, as in any process, you start with the ones where you know there's an influence and then uh, go further in your research. Thank you very much, Heiko. Uh, the next question, and uh, Ayman, if the question was well explained or if you have anything else, just let us know in the chat and we can bring it also to the panel. And then the next question, one second, as I go through the chat is regarding, um, yeah, location technology and integrating location technology. Uh, basically, how is it done today or if, if how is it planned to be done? We, we are implementing a location technology for parts and spare parts across the world. So kind of identifying not only the history of engines, but uh, tracking certain parts or being able to identify where they are. We also think about implementing that for any parts which come in into the factory to just know exactly by what time they leave the factory, et cetera, and where they are. So that is, um, that is, I think, the macro location of the parts. We're not using currently location technologies in the plan during assembly. So that is uh, a step after next, as I would say, but uh, more implementing it on a macro level to identify where they are around the world so we can better forecast when they arrive at the factory. Then that's exactly uh, great, and I hope that uh, this question is from Jan. Jan, I hope that this question, that this answer covers uh, your question. Heiko, thank you very much for taking questions, and thank you everybody for this little interruption. As uh, we bring, I just wanted really to have the opportunity to, for people to ask the questions before uh, Heiko has to leave us. So I will basically bring it on stage and our final speaker, and that is Andreas Zettler. Andreas is a senior researcher at Siemens. He joined in 2009 and has a long history in research activities in the area of industrial automation with focus on industrial networks. Andreas will be joining us on stage and presenting a bit about his use case and his insights. Thank you very much, Andreas, for being here with us today. The stage is yours. Okay, so I talk uh, 
few minutes about the Intelliate project and the manufacturing use cases, especially of the Intelliate project. Uh, this is a EU funded project in the Horizon 2020 call for next generation Internet of Things. Intelliate sounds a bit like buzzword bingo stands for intelligent, distributed, human centered and trustworthy IoT environments. Um, we started just in October last year, so we are quite of the beginning, uh, in the beginning of the project. We have defined our use cases and we're now um, refining our requirements. Um, we have three use cases, agriculture, healthcare and manufacturing. Three use cases from very difficult domain, uh, different domains. And uh, the goal is to demonstrate that we have um, different domains, but we always can apply uh, the same intelligent platform. So what it's about, we have applications, intelligent, intelligent applications, which are represented by agents, um, a hypermass system, so a multiple agent system um, to make these different apps work together. Of course, in reality, these app need to be deployed. Uh, sorry, that was unplanned. <laughs> need to be de deployed on real hardware. Um, depending on the use case, this can be very different hardware. It can be uh, mobiles, wearables, drones in the man manufacturing, uh, in the agriculture use case. Robots, for example, in the manufacturing use case, of course, we always need some computation uh, infrastructure and they're really doing closed loop interaction between uh, the apps, closed loop control. So we need a tactile communication network between them. By tactile, we mean uh, really uh, good guarantees on quality of service of the communication. Um, we defined three pillars. Um, we need to achieve our goals. The first pillar is collaborative IoT. Maybe I can use a laser pointer. Does that work? Hopefully, yes. Um, so in the collaborative IoT pillar, this is about the collaborating apps um, represented by agents uh, and working together to fulfill a task. So for example, to make a tractor driving, um, to monitor heart rates, blood pressure of patients, or to have a workpiece manufactured in the manufacturing use case. The second pillar is the human in the loop. Um, means wherever we need help because we have AI on the apps um, and the apps need to be confident. Um, if the apps are not very confident in their de decisions, for example, uh, the tractor is not so sure how to get around an obstacle. Um, the heart rate monitor is not sure if this heart rate, uh, heart rate is fine or maybe a doctor should be called or a robot. We just heard about that, that it's not always easy. Uh, the robot is not sure how to grab a workpiece maybe because he has not seen a similar workpiece um, before. Um, then these uh, apps bring the human in the loop. That means they ask back to a human uh, operator, doctor or farmer and get help. And then of course should learn from that help and federated learning between all the machines, all the uh, robots in the plant, for example, and all the uh, tractors on the field in the agriculture use case. And the third pillar is trustworthiness. That's also very important um, that the, uh, the apps can trust each other, that we can trust the end user. We also have uh, event capture system running to make sure um, that the system is not hacked and abused by some malicious humans, black hat actors, something like that. Um, so here's the manufacturing use case. Um, in, the, in the manufacturing use case, we are talking about a shared manufacturing plant. Uh, with a shared manufacturing plant, we mean, uh, like we heard in the beginning, uh, from Relayer, we mean that the machines are maybe not all you, uh, owned by the plant operator, the plant owner. They could be owned by the machine vendors or by some third party, for example, Relayer. Um, and we are talking about uh, small lot sizes. So we're not talking about uh, producing millions of identical things each day. We are um, thinking of 
maybe a uh, lot size one production. Um, what happens here is first the customer orders a product and is that uh, not from a catalog like often uh, done today, but he defines a manufacturing goal. So he describes um, what kind of product he needs. And then we have this process planning and machine orchestration here uh, running on the plant edge. Of course, it needs some hardware where it can be located, um, which plans how this workpiece can be produced with the machines available in the plant. All the machines are represented by machine descriptions. And then this um, process planning prints out tasks which, which should be done by the machines and agents representing the machines take over the tasks and um, do the necessary manufacturing steps. It could be that this planning um, faces issues. For example, the customer, the goal the customer has defined is a bit ambiguous. So in this case, the plant edge will go back to the customer and ask for a clarification. It could also be that maybe a machine description of a machine in the plant is not sufficient to be sure if this machine can handle the workpiece, the, the work step or not. So in this case, the edge could ask the plant operator or even the machine vendor for help. When the robot then takes a task to transport a workpiece, um, it has a AI on the robot um, looking at the workpiece, deciding how to grab it, how to transport it. And again here, um, it could be that the robot does not know how to grab the workpiece. And again, he can uh, get back to the plant operator and get help for his task. And again, um, when the robot receives help, it learns from that help. And we also update the other models in the plant means we do ferreted learning uh, so that all the other robots, if they see, diff uh, see similar work pieces, then in future, hopefully can deal with that work piece without having human help again. For the demonstration of the use case, we have a small scale demonstrator, uh, small scale, but um, enough complexity to show all the features of the platform. We have some uh, wooden work pieces, so uh, tree trunks, and we have machines to laser or engrave or whatever you want to do um, with the tree trunks. We have a, a robot to transport the work pieces. And of course, we need some uh, computation infrastructure we call the edge, where we can deploy apps on. Um, and we have a TSN-based communication backbone in the factory connecting the edge, the uh, the machines, the robot, the camera and the robot, um, what we, what all we need in the plant. Um, we have, of course, a user, which brings the product descriptions, the goals to the plant. Uh, and here we have a trust to the user. That means whenever a user defines a new goal, we have a, what we call a smart contract. We write the smart contract to a DLT. So that if there's any issue afterwards, we can prove what happened. And as I said, also when a machine takes a task, a robot takes a transport task, every time we write a smart contract to the DLT uh, in order to, be, to can prove what happened here. So then when the robot um, transports a workpiece, it has an AI on board to see the workpiece, um, very similar to what Jacob just said uh, a few minutes ago. And if the robot is not sure enough, so if the confidence level of the AI is not high enough so that the robot is sure that he can safely transport this workpiece because the shape is maybe too different from what he has ever seen before, we use 5G technology to have a tactile connection to uh, one operator. This operator is wearing virtual reality glasses and the operator uh, is using this stylus input device coming from a project partner and then he can directly move the robot, guide the robot to grab the workpiece. And then of course the robot learns from that help and federates the learning with other robots in the plant. Um, and what we have in the the 
the, in the use case is the event capture. That means everything happens here is analyzed by an event capture deployed on every app. And when something strange happens, for example, we have uh, this malicious human taking over control of the robot, uh, but not with the intention to help the robot, but maybe to break the robot or use the camera on the robot to spy around uh, in the plant and see things he shouldn't see. Uh, the event capture will detect that and alert the operator to lock that human out. Um, some works on our plant work. Uh, work. Don't worry, I'm not going to uh, talk too much about our milestones, but there are two things which could be interesting for some of you. Uh, first thing is we have what we call end user workshops. Two of them, one very soon, March and April this year, second round next year uh, in June and July. Um, end user workshops are made for a kind of reality check for what we are doing in the project in the use cases. So they are uh, end user workshops for all of the use cases. In manufacturing, we are looking for, of course, plant owners and operators, but also system integrators, machine builders, automation component vendors, which bring technology to the plants, industrial workers, um, we already have heard that, which later have to deal with the system, also have to trust the system, and of course, end user associations. So if you belong to one of them, if you feel uh, that you are interested in the use case, can give inputs, can give requirements, please contact us, and we would be very happy to invite you to our end user workshops. And the second thing I want to talk about are the open calls. There's also budget in the open calls, as you see here. One is in October, starting in October this year, one in October next year. Uh, the open calls are meant for, especially for small enterprises, for startups, which want to bring their technology into our project, into our use cases, um, demonstrate their technology, showcase the technology, and maybe improve our project, our use case with new possibilities, new ideas we didn't have before. So if you're interested, we would be very happy to hear from you. Um, here are several links, several ways to get more information about the project. Here's my email address. So if you have any questions, want to join uh, end user workshops or open calls, I would be happy to hear from you. That's all from my side, and I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Andy. I think that our colleagues at Startup Colors has already uh, added the link to the chat. So if you feel that you could contribute, as Andy said, please take a look and let's make uh, this project as great as possible. Uh, this is also a call out for the Meetup AI community if you're willing to, to join us uh, on, on this one. And if so, we will start off uh, the panel we already have quite a few questions coming from the audience and we will have only 20 minutes give or so for the panel. So I'm gonna to try to be as quick as possible. And I'm gonna start off with maybe a question that kept coming back as we saw all of the presentations and that is the complexity of actually implementing, let's say brand new solutions inside of manufacturing because of how complex the systems are already there. So I'd like to start off asking there are three speakers uh, about what is, in your opinion, the biggest bottleneck in implementing, let's say, brand new technologies inside of the factory floor. I've, uh, I'm going to go in the same order as we had the speakers uh, speaking. So, Jackson, if you can tell us a bit about your experience, especially, uh, let's say, earlier on in the relayer days as you were bringing this new technology inside of the factories, what was the biggest bottleneck to get it implemented? Yeah, so I think it's still uh, consistent today. Um, it hasn't really changed. I think um, the first major blocker is the uh, what we call digital maturity of the uh, company that we're, we're engaging with. Um, and the companies we engage with, again, are uh, machine makers, machine manufacturers, or they service those machines. And typically, you know, they're uh, delivering machines to factory floors. And it's really about, does the CEO or the business owners, they could be business unit division uh, business owners or CEOs, do they understand the importance of data? Do they understand the importance uh, or the uh, opportunity 
of building new business cases, leveraging the data from their machines. Uh, because if, and that applies to the businesses and the companies that we engage with, but also their end customers. So the ones who use their equipment, because ultimately then they have to turn around and sell a new type of an offering to those factories or those factory owners or those factory operators and convince them, hey, we're going to give you a, a new piece of equipment that you don't have to buy. You don't have to pay for anymore. You get it uh, as a service and you pay per X. And so for a lot of those factory and those customers, they also have a mental block. <laughs> it's a mental block that says, I don't understand this. No, 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 no. My, my world, the world that I know, I buy a machine, but I can't buy your machine because it's too expensive. <laughs> and so first it's, it's a mental block. I would say just to keep it simple, that's, that's the short answer is the only, I think we, so we look for CEOs and teams that are already thinking in that direction because those are the ones who are pioneering the way. And the ones who are not, we tend to avoid. That's a very good point. Extremely good point. So Jacob, I will send the same question over to you, please. No, but I can only agree with Jackson. I mean, one of the big problems we had early on, especially when selling this type of virtual reality training, which is, yes, there is some technical challenges, but that's never really the big hurdle. It's the people and maturity uh, among the people for uh, utilizing this type of new technology. And I think we, similar to a lot of other early startups working with innovative products, tend to get stuck in this proof of concept hell. <laughs> yeah, there is innovation money uh, dedicated to these type of projects. You have innovation managers that would love to see a proof of concept. But, you know, after that, it's not much happening. And I think that's, that's very much why we also have been, been, been kind of going in similar direction to what Jackson is, is, is speaking about. And also something he said previously in regards to it's the ones kind of that's going to win the market. I don't think they are going to be the one who's bringing the best technology. I think it's the ones that can kind of bridge it with a business model and a way to help the clients actually take this new technology in and get over that little knowledge gap that they are scared of. For us, that has meant trying to take virtual reality training from being something that you either have in-house staff or you buy consultancy hours to build your VR application that you have packaged, you own it. And then when a new headset comes, you need to develop a new one or update it to make it into a subscription that is a little bit easier to digest. You're instead subscribing to a course just as you would previously. So we're adopting to the way that they are purchasing training before not the way that they were purchasing simulations or 3D assets or even 3D movies for that matter. We're trying to adapt it so it make it simple for them to take it from the OPEX training budget rather than make it the big CAPEX investment. So for us, this has been quite a long journey and it's so much, you know, you, you get into big company, you, you kind of find an individual, an inside hero that's kind of pushing it through and then that person leaves and you're back to the first step again. So it's really a people and maturity problem. I definitely uh, agree with that. It's a very, very good point, Jacob. Thank you very much. Andy, so what about you? Coming from a different side, uh, what do you feel are some of the big bottlenecks? Yeah, I think both of uh, Jackson and Jacob are completely right with what they say. And in my experience, it starts already earlier. So if you think about big automation plants, they must be very reliable. So only 10 minutes uh, of standstill costs hundred thousands, ten thousands of uh, euros. Um, they need very reliable uh, technology. And my personal feeling, they are sometimes frightened to try something new. They're not really sure that it will work. Um, I'm personally coming from uh, network technology. And there, so it starts at very simple points. So we bring new technology in the OT environment. So in the operational technology in the plants, and we say, okay, take this box, connect it to the internet and it will send you data. And in that moment, IT and OT department 
agree very soon that this will never be possible because you have to connect IT and OT for that. And it's quite hard work to convince both of them that this can be done and that it's not dangerous um, and profitful at the end. <laughs> The, that's a very, very good point. And before I bring the, the questions from the community, uh, there was a question that I wanted to send back to Jack, uh, Jackson and Jacob, which is a, question, it's a point that you two brought, which is about the combination of new technology and new business models. Uh, do you believe, after the experience that you had in the factories right now, that to leverage the potential of technology, we have to think about new ways of selling it or new ways of introducing it to the to the factory, they're just trying to put new technology in old systems might just not work. Whoever wants to take it first, Jackson or Jacob. So let's do you, Jackson. Um, I think there are opportunities in both areas, but I think um, the common theme is to avoid what Jakob was talking about, uh, pilotitis, we call it. <laughs> um, getting stuck in in pilot mode, which is usually on the on the um, research and development budget, so it's a it's a cost, and it's not changing fundamentally changing the business. And so, um, from our perspective, we only engage with companies who are prepared or ready and thinking about changing their business, and that's our starting point. We need to define a value and put a value on that new technology or on the technology. What are we trying to achieve from a business standpoint? How much more revenue? How much cost savings? What is our margin, right? That's our core question first. If we can answer that, then we figure out what the technology needs to be. Technology in our experience is never the problem. It's the most always the problem is the business model. That's a very good point, Jacob. Yeah, no, I think I don't think it's only about us having to bring a new business model because it's a different time. I think that the new technology is enabling a different business model as well, as kind of the unique selling points and the kind of core technology to a greater extent is in the software rather than the hardware. I think we're also moving in a direction where the incremental cost for deployment is much lower than it used to be for innovative products. So with that, when you're deploying software, obviously you're looking at, you know, trying to lower the threshold for the client. And I think this is the reason why we start seeing subscription economy or as, as Jackson is talking about, you pay per based on the usage. It makes much more sense for the CFO, for the CEO, all the decision makers is also adaptable in the sense that if I don't have a huge incremental cost for delivering it to you, then it makes sense. I mean, it's the exact same thing that has happened in the TV industry, in the music industry with streaming. I mean, it's, it's why would you need to buy every song as an individual uh, thing <laughs> if you don't actually need to buy the actual hardware for it, uh, the, the actual CD of it? Uh, we're adapting to kind of the economy just the same way. So I, I do think that the new type of technology that we're bringing is enabling a different business model that is easier to digest for anyone. And that is easier to kind of initiate because you don't have to take this huge risk of the payback for you know, several years and huge you know, unknown factors. You instead start subscribing and you pay if you're solving a problem. And if you're solving a problem, you can hopefully uh, see a revenue or a reduction of the cost there. So. Very, very good point. Uh, a question that came from the audience a few times is regarding data, and I'd like to send it to, to Andreas first, but it's a question that I would like to ask the, the whole panel because it has been in one way or another asked of all speakers. The, uh, let's start with Andy because you work in a system right now that has multiple different partners. And how is data sharing being done today? The, are different partners sharing the data that they're collecting? Or is data mostly siloed inside of it? Is this a problem? Are you guys trying to solve this inside of Intelliate? How do you see this issue, Andreas? Uh, that's a very good advantage of a funded project because in the funded projects, uh, we are sharing data. We are sharing experience also. Um, in the day-to-day -day business, it's not always easy to share data because we have 
property rights. We have fear to da da of data to be stolen, um, especially in the healthcare sector, also an issue for our healthcare use case. Uh, there are many regulations by law um, that you cannot uh, open patient data, so they must be uh, invisible or separated from the patient information. Uh, yeah, data is, so I'm not the, the expert in, in data science or data trading, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a hot topic, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I would like to, to ask uh, Jackson to, to add to it, how is your experience in Relayer with sharing or collecting data? And there has been a question specifically to you, Jackson, from Marco, asking if you monetize that data as well, if, uh, or if you see an opportunity to monetize the data that you're already collecting from from your clients, maybe in in so, other areas. Yeah, it's a it's one of the key questions and the one that comes up very quickly and it's it's a really really important question. So thanks for asking it. Um, first of all, when we're cooperating with, a, for example, a machine maker, the machine maker, the data that is being generated by the machines that he makes, that data is their data. End of story. Now, if we can create additional value on top of that data, meaning we can avoid a machine failure or we can improve and guarantee a quality output, the quality of the product, or we can uh, improve the amount of qu the quantity of output and we can guarantee that, then that's an additional value that's, that didn't exist before. And that guaranteeability, we can guarantee that, we can take that risk. And so our discussion is always about value. If we can build and provide a value that's strong enough for the end customer, the one who uses the machine, if that value, um, if they accept it and they like it, the trade-off is, well, we're going to use some of the data from the machine in cooperation, that's a critical piece, in cooperation with the machine maker who gives us permission to use that data. And it doesn't have to be customer specific. That data can be abstracted and it's focused only on the performance of the machine um, and not necessarily, let's say, associated directly with secret recipes of the output if it's, for example, pharmaceuticals, or if it's food and beverage, or if it's chemicals, it's abstracted away from that output or that quality. Um, but you have to be very transparent about it, right? So it's a very important discussion to have early on. If we share data, what's the value add that we all benefit from? And the end customer, most importantly, the end customer, what does the end customer, how, does they, how do they benefit from that sharing of data? And do they have a problem with it? Because most of the time, the end customer, if you ask them, are you prepared to share data? You just ask them that question. No, they don't wanna share data. But if you tell them, would you like a guarantee that that machine will never fail and that you'll get always 100% quality? Oh yeah, I'd like that. I'd like that, right? That value, okay, well then to get that value, we're gonna to have to share the data. Oh, okay, That's, that makes sense. Usually it's, it's sort of that discussion. It depends on how you present it. Very, very good. Uh, Jacob, uh, unless you wanna also come and comment on the, on the data question, there's also a specific question for you coming from the point of uh, using virtual reality for, for training. So it's your choice. Do you wanna mention the data point or do you wanna the virtual I training? I can mention question? quickly on the data point. I think it's a very fascinating good. discussion uh, to a large extent. I mean, I would be, very impressed if, if consumers were even close to caring as much about their data as, as our clients. In <laughs> essence, I mean, that's, that's, that's funny because one of the leading uh, headset providers, the technology we're using to actually display our, our, our software, uh, Oculus is owned by Facebook. And that's the absolutely dominating player on the, the, uh, the consumer market. But we see uh, more and more of the big uh, industrial companies refusing to use this type of hardware because they are so afraid of kind of how the data, what data is being collected from Facebook to the extent that they rather 
Uh, one of the, the the players that we see in Stockholm uh, kind of rising now is is a quite small Chinese startup, where I'm pretty sure they have made a much smaller due diligence on. Uh, but it's such a, this is a huge huge discussion in regards to it. In our sense, we always need to treat this quite carefully. The customer owns all the data, all the courses, all the training, all the uh, material that they are providing. But it's similar to kind of how how, how Jackson was formulating it. We're building up an object database uh, that is supposed to be generic, and when we're asking if they want to own all of the data themselves, then that's a very important aspect. But if we're telling them that, well, okay, then we're the costs are going to go up because we're going to have to recreate a lot of objects that you will own. Then it's quite quickly the the the, the data aspect is is kind of getting down prioritized. But uh, yeah, it's certainly a sensitive matter. But I think as long as you talk with the client, uh, there's often ways to kind of find a good way of collaborating. What was the other question? I I didn't. I will I will bring it I will bring it right up. But just on the point that you two made and also Andy made, I think this comes so often, right? That it's not only a question of asking people, can I have your data? Is can we collaborate with your data? Can I provide you mm. some extra benefit exactly. with it? And then then the conversation changes completely. And we heard the very same thing at our last. A collaboration event in agriculture that farmers were open to sharing their data as long as they could see a benefit in doing so and in that sense it is a very very good way by the way people that are interested in the agriculture event there is already on youtube and you can check it up on the youtube video and uh, youtube channel from from intelligent but the question about uh, virtual reality it comes from shiraz and it is if you know any use cases of virtual reality being used for vendor acceptance tests or factory acceptance tests. So basically to accept machines and... Yeah, sure. I mean, we're working right now looking into a an, an factory acceptance test uh, with a client I, I can't really mention. We haven't really specifically worked on it, but it is uh, certainly a use case that I do think makes a lot of sense. So uh, for sure. That is great. Uh, a question from Jackson that actually came three times <laughs> uh, from the chat. And it is a lot of people seem to think from the community here that the equipment as a service model might cannibalize other parts of the, of the industry. So somebody, Terrell mentioned that the equipment as a service could reduce the monetization potential of maybe predictive maintenance, which I found a, an interesting point because predictive maintenance is the main reason why a lot of people are investing in, in such uh, systems. But then uh, there was also a question of uh, companies are already investing a lot of money to buying machines to create a bit of a moat, to have something that only they can create. And if uh, the equipment as a service uh, option could run into problems with that mentality. So how do you feel about, how you feel about that? And uh, maybe how has the equipment as a service idea been, been received by the market? Um, so quickly to the last question, I think, um, I don't know if you remember my slide on the market, so that should answer that quite well. I think uh, you're seeing a, a, a strong uptake and interest in equipment as a service and lots and lots of machine makers are investing in um, trying to provide and offer new uh, equipment or servitized business models. Um, they're looking at a triple digit growth rate over the next, uh, between now and, or a triple digit, I say penetration between now and 2024, 2025. Um, in terms of cannibalization, I think equipment as a service is not a one size fits all. It doesn't make sense for every customer. And that's why we start our, our journey with any machine maker um, to understand their business economics, right? The economics of their value chain. What do their customers need? And so if you take Trump, for example, the Trump case, what they, what they realize is that a lot of their customers um, really would much rather have uh, Trump take the risk for the operation of the machine. They'd rather have Trump take uh, the risk for the quality of the, of the production of the, of, the, of the metal part that's cut with the machine. Um, and that brings more benefit and they'd much rather have a price, a, you know, a price stabilization. And because they have a lot of other uh, variabilities in, their, in, the, in how they take that metal piece and process it further. Um, and so that has a lot of benefit, right? Um, 
it doesn't always make sense. To the question around predictive maintenance, predictive maintenance would be something that we would, you know, would be included into any kind of equipment as a service would be any types of performance guarantees. And that's part of the, um, the value equation. As you collect the data and as you have over time, as the system learns and becomes more and more predictive, you are driving all your costs down, right? And you're improving your ability to guarantee any performance metric, which means you're seeing more value on the top side, you're getting more, you can charge more for that. And on the bottom, uh, on the bottom line, you're basically um, reducing all your costs. So you're improving your margin over, over time. And some companies uh, might feel uncomfortable with that if they think that the data we're collecting, uh, you know, and we're transparent about it is going to somehow expose their secrets. But there are many, uh, there, you know, any data scientists can tell you, you can abstract and, and encrypt, you know, data that's specific to a re recipe, for example, uh, you know, IP related data, you can abstract away from that um, to focus on the performance of the asset. So there, there are many ways of, of uh, framing the offering and it doesn't necessarily have to apply to every type of uh, scenario. Some people might want to own the equipment if that improves their, their business. Very, very good point, Jackson. And just a, a quick reminder that technology and innovation is not, not only fits, not always fits every situation in every company. And then we now also have to adapt to the clients and the necessities of the specific issue that we're dealing with. Uh, we have a question which I find interesting uh, because it connects two of our speakers. Uh, Andy uh, spoke about already having uh, in the Intelli project a part about having machines interacting with uh, objects and having like human, let's call it companions, uh, helping train the machines. And then there was a question coming up if Jacob's technology, which is already meant to, te to help teach machines about how to pick up objects, could be used uh, in that direction. So Jacob, actually the question was for you. So I'm gonna give it to you first and then Andy, if you wanna mention, and then I'm gonna just have a final question to, to wrap it up. No, but I think it's a, a great question. It's possibly not where we're gonna make a whole bunch of money in the coming two years, but it's this type of technology that I really love and that we're looking into a lot uh, in the kind of robotics tracks, which is more of a long-term investment from our sense. Yes, it's a short answer. I mean, what we're doing is precision grasping. So in essence, if you, you have a telepresence uh, with a robot where you're controlling the robot arm to a certain position with possibly a limited number of inputs, like six degrees of freedom, you have an orientation, uh, rotation, and, and, and an actual position of the, the, the joint that includes the hand or the fingers or whatever you might have on the robot. And then we can com complement that by uh, contributing with the precision grasping of whatever object you might have. Because that is very difficult when you look at telepresence. You don't have the haptics of when you're trying to pick up a glass. It doesn't automatically stop where you're supposed to. You don't feel the weight, you don't feel the friction, etc. So uh, I do think that there is an element of how you need to uh, complete the type of training where you are doing 95% of the controlling yourself, but then you need an additional help to really get the precision grasping in place. And that's certainly an interesting use case uh, for us. Interesting. Andy, anything to add to that one? Yeah, I think this is exactly the reason why we went for this human in the loop concept in Intel yet, because the first 95% are, I don't want to say easy, but manageable. And then there may be two, three percent, um, the robot cannot grip it. Um, that's, by the way, the reason why we don't have autonomous cars right now running on our streets, because we have still some one digit percentage of situations which are too difficult for the car, but that's too much um, for the mass of the cars on the streets. And if you imagine the robot gripping a uh, thousand work pieces a day, if he loses two, and this was a, a half-made product of a customer, um, that shouldn't be. And maybe it drops it in the machine or so, it damages the machine. This is exactly uh, what for us is the reason for the human in the loop. And the interesting thing will be if we detect early enough if the AI on the robot is sure enough or not. 
It's a very, very, very good point. Uh, and then the final question that I have for the panel, it is advice. So basically for people out there trying to bring innovation to the field, trying to, to crack into the, the factory or manufacturing space, is there any short advice that you can give mostly for startups, but also for people in other industries trying to start to succeed? So what would you say, Jackson, to a, a young startup or trying to join the same field that you guys are in? Not to outcompete you, of course, but uh, what is the advice? Um, I think it will, I'll just repeat what I, I ended my presentation on, which is that it's never about the technology. It's, although we are a technology company and the technology drives uh, the innovation, um, it's never really about the technology. It's about the business case. How, why are you doing this? What is the value you're creating? So my advice would be focus on the value and the business opportunity, and then explain how the, the technology will, will create that value, will create that business. Very, very good point. I think that's honestly, I think this is good advice for everybody in any technology. Uh, let's have uh, Jacob also following the way. No, I, I really agree on it. I think one of the, the uh, key aspects is to really identify how are we actually, what, what problem are we solving and how do we kind of quantify that, that, that uh, problem if we're implementing your solution. Too much pitches and ideas are about great technology. But at the end of the day, if someone is going to invest money on it, they need to see where they are saving money. And then <laughs> it also goes back to get to that point. You obviously need to meet a lot of people. And I think these type of innovation managers that are in a lot of industrial companies are often great to bounce ideas with, get and collect input. They're often able to share more knowledge uh, about their kind of companies than you would think. So in order to get there, be able to build that, that, that financial case, I would say, go out and meet a lot of people. That's a very, very good point. And then I'm going to have Andy kind of saying his final words. And then I'm going to give the, the stage to Dominic to say the final words from the, in, from the Startup Colors uh, side. Andy? Yeah, no, it, it has been quite a long time ago that Siemens has been a startup. So I'm not, <laughs> not an expert in that. <laughs> but maybe uh, use our open calls uh, to leverage your ideas to bring it to public. Very, very good one. <laughs> Perfect ending. <laughs> Dominic, stage is yours. And just a final a couple of words from my side. I think everybody who has stayed until the end with us today, this event has been recorded and will be on in YouTube. Thank you very much for your questions. I also added my LinkedIn on chat in case you want to reach out for feedback or any ideas for future events. Thank you, Startup Callers and Telliot and all our speakers today for sharing and Heiko as well, who is not with us at the moment. Thank you from the Meetup AI side as well. And Dominic, now to close it off. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Nico. Thanks for your moderation again. And thank you to our um, great speakers. This was super interesting. And I think we could probably go on with the discussion for much longer, but we're already a little bit over time. And I guess everybody uh, is also happy to wrap up the day, but it has been super interesting. So thank you all very much. I just wanted to quickly point out that uh, we'll be teaming up again with Meetup AI for another meetup um, uh, on April 8th. And there we are going to look uh, into health tech. So um, the focus on remote uh, patient monitoring and how AI can support that. And he touched upon it a little bit. This is also one of the use cases uh, of Intelliot. So we'll have somebody from Philips there uh, sharing their point of view also uh, from the hospital side of things to talk about what um, has been done uh, with AI in hospitals and in, in patient care and, and patient monitoring already. Uh, and we'll also have uh, a startup, uh, one or two startups on board. So uh, you'll find all the information on our profiles that were shared. Uh, it would be great to maybe see some of you there again. Uh, and with that, I think uh, all that's left to say is thank you all very much for spending the afternoon, the early evening with us. Thanks again to the speakers. It was uh, uh, really a pleasure. And um, have a great evening and have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the nice event. Bye-bye.